Welcome everybody to our webinar. Thank you all for joining. I'm very excited about today's webinar with Juan Ordus. I personally have been a fan of Juan for a while now and really all started when I found his blog posts, uh, which are real treasure trove and they show very in-depth and advanced usage of PyMC to solve current problems in marketing analytics. And when I then contacted him, we found out that we actually both lived in Berlin, Germany. So we started having these uh, fun lunches and uh, became friends that way. When thinking about one, um, it's kind of rare to have someone who really has both a very deep statistical expertise, as well as really deep domain expertise with many years of having worked on the ground and really solve these problems hands-on uh, in various different settings and roles. So I'm very grateful that today he's sharing uh, his vast knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, so one give it away. We have a Q&A section here that you can use. If you have questions, they uh, will uh, just put them in whenever we can answer them. Uh, we'll probably answer them at the end, um, but we'll play it by ear. And uh, yeah, so that's when the Q&A starts. So yeah, with that, uh, one, give it away. All right, thank you very much for the kind words. It's really a pleasure also having the the opportunity to meet you in Berlin and also to be, uh, meet people from the PyMC Labs team, which is an amazing and talented team where we've been uh, yeah, working on certain collaborations that we talk about. So yeah, I'm very happy to be here. So I'm gonna go and share my screen now. Hope everyone can see it. I'm going to make it bigger. Yes. So, all right. So the the idea of today's session is is more to 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 give an overview of kind of certain applications for patient methods in marketing analytics. And this is by no means exhaustive, but it's type of the type of projects which I've encountered, and I would like to share that with you. And yeah, get some feedback and let's say district conversations around this topic because uh, I still believe there's there's a lot of potential in this domain. Uh, all right, so again, what's the purpose of today? It's really about seeing how patient methods can effectively help uh, solve the marketing data science problems. And we're not going to go into very kind of uh, detail uh, description of the method, but rather to get an overview and we can all, always reach to me or the Pantry Labs team if you want to get to know more about uh, certain applications. I will share the slides with you so that you can have this the references and all the links uh, that I'll show you today. So a little bit of a, today's outline. So I'll give a bit, a little bit of an introduction. I will start with a, a relatively simple ap application with this experimentation, and it's just to, uh, kind of a, a good example to set up the the language, the notation, and to explain how very simple models can uh, be very useful. I am going to move into what is called media mix models, which are a little bit more advanced and actually becoming really popular or like these days, in spite of the fact that they are relatively classic methods. I will then move to customer lifetime value problems. I'll briefly talk about contextual inference. This is not going to be the main topic, but I still want to mention also some collaboration with the PyMC Labs team. And at the very end, I want to talk about kind of a more kind of experimental approach to, to model retention revenue matrices. And I'll share some references with you so that you can uh, go on and see the details for yourself. So in spite of the fact that we're going to talk about kind of data science problems I, and, and statistics and Bayesian method, uh, we shouldn't uh, kind of lose track of the big picture, which is at the very end, we have a business problem that we want to solve and we want to use a model uh, to help us understand and, and yeah, allow us to solve this business problem and, and make the, the outcome of it actionable so that we can actually uh, do something, right? So it's not the sake of doing modeling just to, to fit models, but really the big picture. So I guess this is the most important slide. Uh, please keep in mind that this is like a cycle where the model is just a piece of, let's say the business problem, integration with product, uh, how we measure the efficiency or like how we're measuring the performance of this model. We have a feedback loop with stakeholders and this is um, a, an ongoing cycle. 
So, and within all that cycle, I think the modern device is also really the, the simple one. What is challenging is to really put this into the, the business process and, and make sure that we use them. Uh, so I guess if you've been following uh, all of the webinars uh, that PyMC Labs has been offering, you probably are familiar with the benefits or uh, tools which Bayesian frameworks provide. So one of the things that I like the most is that it forces you to explicitly think about the data generation process. So even if at the very end you'd end up doing something that is not Bayesian, just having this mindset of, of writing the data generation process actually makes you to explicitly describe your assumptions, which is already very good. Uh, uh, one second. Okay, yeah, the, the, the other point is that I, uh, being able to add priors is, is something that I find very powerful because at the very end, uh, it's, it's domain knowledge, which we can encode uh, as constraints. And in domains where you have a lot of data, this might not be super interesting or useful, but in marketing, sometimes we don't have enough data or the data quality is not the best. So in order to make sense out of it, uh, having domain expertise, being able to, to be pushed into the model to prioritize is something very powerful. Uh, I, I like the flexibility because it's kind of a Lego-like approach where you can start with something simple and should always start with something simple and then build on top. Uh, and of course, the uncertainty quantification, which is something also very important when you want to, to really make decisions and assess risk uh, for, for different scenarios or outcomes of the models. So the first experiment is a, it's a little simulation that, that I wrote. Uh, this is something that I presented in a, in a previous meetup uh, at Vault, where I'm currently work at. And the idea is just to simulate a geo experiment on you where you have a city and you have, let's say, orders over time and you launch a campaign. Let's say you are giving away some vouchers or discounts. And you want to see whether this in, uh, kind of induces an uplift on orders. So you, you have big zip codes, you have a uh, small zip codes, and you at the very end, for, for the sake of simplicity, you have like a, a you want to have a measure of how good the campaign was. So there are various ways of doing this. I'm going to just show you a very simple one, which is called time-based uh, regression. Uh, and the idea is to select a couple of geos. In this case, we're going to have uh, select all of them. And we're going to see or, and actually test whether there's a linear relationship between the aggregation of these two, the treatment and control group. And if we find a linear regression between them, uh, then we can actually fit a simple regression model. And so that in the campaign period, in the post intervention period, we can estimate let's say the control factor through this model, meaning what would have happened based on the historical data if we wouldn't have uh, run the campaign. And by taking the difference also, in, in particular taking account the uncertainty, you can then estimate what's the uplift associated with this, with this campaign. So what you can do is, uh, I hope you can see my screen, you have here your training data with the control data, of, uh, of your zip code, and you have also the treatment data pre-intervention. So that's, that's the input. And it, in this case, in the simulated case, we actually see that we, you, we have a linear model, which you can see in this plot here. So this is a pre-intervention when we aggregate all of the orders and we want to run a simple linear regression. So uh, when, when you think about the model as a, as a graph, then you have the input data, the output data, and and let's see how to connect them. So the first thing that you need to do is uh, kind of parameterize uh, your model, meaning give a functional form uh, to the relation of the input data and the, and the target data. So in this case, we're gonna use a simple linear regression uh, where we have an intercept and a coefficient, which we call a, a beta coefficient, which kind of mediates the relationship between the, the uh, controlled and, and treatment group. And uh, we can fit the model, uh, we can do it in, in various ways, but if we run uh, MCMC samplers or like with these patient methods, we get something of, of the following form. We get the prediction and certain credible intervals. And this plot shows that the predictions are actually relatively low as compared to the actual. And then we can say, okay, if we take the aggregation of this difference, that actually what we can attribute to the campaign. 
so more or less all of these models work in this uh, kind of way. You have certain input data, you as a modeler set up a kind of the parametrization and here you can start simple and then making it more complex depending on the data and the assumptions. Uh, you run inference and you take decisions based on that. Uh, all right. Uh, one second. I think. Okay, the annotate doesn't <laughs> leave. So I don't know how to. Uh, okay, let's undo. Or oh, let's erase this. Okay, so if you understand that a uh, kind of concept, then it should be relatively easy now to. Uh, to understand how this looks in PyMC. So this is again, not a lecture about uh, probabilistic programming, but I just wanted to illustrate the fact that kind of the model that you have in mind that you can write in a piece of paper translate quite uh, nicely into a PyMC uh, model. So the first thing that you do is to define your set of variables. So here we're just telling uh, the model what's the uh, training data, which is in this case, the printer version uh, data. Uh, in a second step, you set up the priors, which uh, in essence is telling which models, uh, which variables that you have and maybe constrain them. So in this case, I'm assuming that relationship between the control and the treatment is going to be positive. So I'm imposing a half normal distribution. This is not strictly necessary in this case, but this is just to illustrate the type of constraints that we could include into that. Uh, then we have the parametrization part which in this case is just a, a linear relationship uh, of, of the mean. And yeah, we took a student tier distribution because we, you might want to run something like a robust regression where you want to have fat tails. It's not very important, uh, but it's kind of up the workflow and how you can map this uh, to the model. So that's kind of how this, this type of applications work. And I think that this is quite a nice example. I can show the the, the code with you. But I guess one of the most uh, popular kind of problems now is marketing measurement through media mix models. So the problem here is how do we effectively measure the advertisement efficiency in order to optimize it? This is what we want to do at the very end. And unfortunately, there's no single bullet because uh, the, the marketing strategy and, and, and the world is rather complex. So if you would just have digital channels and kind of a cookie based approach where you can track every user, then the attributions model would be enough. But as more privacy and regulations come into the game, then these attribution models uh, are no longer that deterministic uh, and effective and actually can, can bring you to, to take bad decisions because they, they of course are, are hiding a, a lot of funnel interactions. So a modern way of looking into a holistic way of, of, mar of marketing measurement is through a combination of attribution model, certain type of experimentation, which is something that similar to what I showed in the, past, uh, in, the, in, the in the previous slides, and a media mix model. And the media mix model will try to kind of blend these two information for experimentation and attribution uh, by means of a linear regression. So usually thinking about a target variable, let's say for the sake of simplicity, you have sales and you have certain media spent. It's, it's an input that you, in some sense, control. Let's say you paid a, a ad on, on, on TV, you have a billboard, a, or you paid uh, third parties like Facebook or Google to, to push certain ads. So this is something that you have relatively control uh, into, but you would like to see what's the effect on the target variable. And the relationship is not actually that straightforward because there are many kind of transformations. Or well, let's say the, the, the phenomenon is not, is not that linear. So as a, as a base model, what you can actually use is to consider two types of transformations. One, which is called the carryover or ad stock effect. And the idea here is that there's kind of a, a lack of the effect of the span. So if I if you, for example, have a media spend today, and let's say you you, see, you 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 spend that in showing an ad, then probably not immediately people will buy your product, but maybe it will create a certain type of awareness and they could buy that tomorrow or with a certain type of lag, which, which you actually would like to learn from the data and not manually input. And the other one is the saturation effect, which means that uh, at some point, 
putting more money into the specific channel is not going to give you the same amount of, of sale because otherwise the strategy would be very easy. Just keep putting money into the channel uh, and, and you're done. So uh, the ad stock effect can be seen as a, as a smoothing as you see this, in, this has two examples of two channels, so to say from simulated data. The top row is the, the raw data. The second one is the ad stock transformation, which is smoother. And in the saturation uh, component, uh, you see that actually the, the peaks are chopped off. Uh, so, so that kind of we are we're showing that uh, you cannot keep uh, putting money into the channel because eventually it will just uh, not work linearly. So you would like to learn these transformations uh, from the data. You of course just have control on the input data. You don't have control into how this saturates or, or the carryover effect. So effectively, the input are these orange and, and blue curves and sales could look like this, where you see, for example, seasonality components and other type of, of features like organic sales, which are not driven just by media spend. And the idea is that you want to set up a regression model where the sales are your target and the input channels are your regressors, so to say, and you want to encode this transformation in such a way that you can fit the linear model and also learn the parameters defining the carryover and the saturation effect. So the model in, in essence looks very similar to the one we first saw. You have the data, you have the parameters, which you can constrain through, through the priors. You have the parameterization I, and the likelihood, and then you fit that all together. So if you want to, to get a more details of the model, uh, stay tuned because I'm gonna uh, talk about a, a joint project that we have with the PMC lab folks. But what I wanted to show is that these, through the same invasion methods or that we use in the, the experimentation example, can infer what's kind of the background sales, which let's call it the organic sales and the sales distribution, uh, 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 evolution or contribution over time, uh, which in this case is the blue one and the, and the orange one. Uh, moreover, as we kind of have this fitted model, we can actually run simulations. So what if we'd have globally spent half of it or twice uh, as we would have spent? Should we have gotten the same or like double amount of sales? Well, as we uh, saw that in the data generation process, we impose a certain saturation uh, transformations. We, we expect this not to be the case. And this is what this plot shows. So on the x-axis, you have like this delta parameter, which is the share of how much, like say, increase or decrease with respect to the actual media spend, and then what's the expected amount of sales. And if you think about it, this is this can be very useful uh, for optimization because then you you could, depending on 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 your on your requirements, just select kind of if you have a constrained budget. Uh, how to split and better allocate your, your spend across channels to maximize uh, the expected sales. Uh, and in spite of the fact that this is maybe not super trivial, we have a very cool project, a joint project with the PIMC lag folks, which is called PIMC Marketing. And this is a package on which, let's say, we plan to, to work on very modern uh, marketing me media mix models. And for now, we have in the first release, a very solid baseline uh, where you can check it out. Uh, and you don't need to care much about the model structure because we have written uh, and working on an API which is user-friendly and you could get all of these diagnostics and actually all of the plots that you saw uh, in a relatively simple way. So of course you can dig into the model, but what we're trying to do is to extract that from the user so that we can make all of these models more accessible in, in the Python ecosystem and in the PyMC ecosystem as well. So please check it out if you haven't. Uh, I think this is really, really nice project where we work together with PyMC Labs and other marketing uh, kind of practitioners in the industry. Uh, and, and let's say this is one example of what we plan to do because again, uh, in, in, in the industry, you want to start with a, with a solid, simple baseline, but that might not be enough for applications. And PyMC Labs have developed a really cool uh, extensions of this model where you have time varying coefficients uh, and you can check out their blog 
it's it's really nice and we're really looking forward to to work together to to get this outside to the public to make it more accessible all right so media mix model it's really about acquire uh, customers but that's just half of the story okay, what you also need to make sure is that the customer that you acquire are valuable for you and that the investment actually is paid off in the long run so let us assume that it costs you 100 euros to acquire a customer and on average each customer spends five euros and that's it uh, no matter how fancy your mmm is to to optimize your your media spend if you're not retaining a valuable users just probably just wasting money uh, and and not very be, being very efficient so the cost per acquisition or return on advertisement spend is just one part but it should be coupled to what is called the customer lifetime value which means how much I expect a certain type of user uh, to kind of contribute or to pay uh, to, to, to make this investment back and eventually, of course, to make it even more uh, profitable. So this is, of course, not an easy task. And it, as you would expect, it depends on the business kind of case. So it's very different if you have a kind of subscription-like business model or like just uh, food delivery where you don't have kind of a, a strictly discrete uh, time component. So we can simplify or people have simplified this in a relatively uh, small matrix, which is uh, on the X axis is uh, on the Y axis is the opportunity. So it could be continuous or discrete. And in the X axis, you see if, it's, if there's a contractual setting or a non-contractual setting. So for the sake of today's exposition, but of course this is not exhaustive, there are other type of models for the other quadrants as well. We're gonna focus in the continuous non-contractual, which could be, for example, grocery purchases, or for example, what we do at Vault. And thinking about how to characterize this, uh, the, the purchase pattern, uh, there are three natural kind of data features which are relevant in this case. So one is the frequency, which is essentially the number of repeated purchases a customer has made. Uh, we have the age of the customer T and recency, which essentially encodes what, when was the last purchase, right? So these features, which are actually pretty easy to compute from transactional data, uh, give us a really good characterization of the type of users uh, that we have. So you can actually just take these features and do a segmentation on top of that. And that's what people call a RFM segmentation. I mean, you can, of course, add the monetary value per transaction uh, to be more precise. And that's already a great start. But uh, of course, you can do, you can do better. So there are, there are fam a family of models, which are often called or known as fine-tuned dive models, which allow you to estimate the, the, the customer lifetime value using this input uh, data. So I'm gonna focus on one example. Uh, there are many flavors of it, uh, which is the uh, BGNBD model and the Gamma Gamma model. So the BGNBD model uh, takes the recency, the age and the frequency of the users and outputs the number of expected purchases per user for a given time period. And this is what we call the purchase prediction. Uh, the Gamma Gamma model does something similar, but instead of uh, predicting the, the number of purchases is actually is predicting the number, uh, the monetary uh, size, let's say the basket size. So if you think about it, once you have the number of future uh, purchase and the expected uh, monetary value per purchase, then you can essentially can multiply this to get an estimation of the customer life and value. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the details of this model, but not too much. And the BGNBD model, it has a nice feature that as, as a part of, of the data generation process that it's assuming, it can also give you an estimation of the probability of being active or alive in this non-contractual setting, which can also be very useful for problems uh, of churn prevention and churn uh, yeah, prediction uh, in this non-contractual setting. So there's a vast literature of, of, of this model. I'm afraid it's, let's say the, the connection between industry and academia can be improved. And we hope with, with this type of analysis and work, we can bring them together. But let's say, as I mentioned, the, the whole point about, let's say one of the main 
uh, ideas of, of running version analysis, it's just by itself thinking about the data generation process. So in this case, we're assuming that the transactions uh, follow a kind of a decaying exponential cur uh, curve and each uh, user has a decay rate of lambda. So this is like a reasonable assumption. Uh, and this lambda depends on the user. And we, this lambda, it's, it's bigger than zero, but we can also kind of model the heterogeneity of these parameters. And we can say, okay, in spite of the fact that this lambda uh, depends on just, uh, depends on the user, we expect all of this lambda to come from a kind of global distribution because you want to model somehow the fact that users are relatively similar. So if you're doing this at cohort level, it actually makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, and this kind of heterogeneity can be modeled with a gamma distribution, which has now two parameters, alpha and R. And actually these are just two parameters. They don't depend on the user. Uh, so it's kind of simplifying the problem a bit. Uh, and then you're assuming that each customer uh, becomes, let's say has a coin and becomes inactive with probability P. And every time they make a purchase, they have the coin, they flip it. And if they get uh, heads, let's say they, they're gone. That's the decision-making process. And of course, this P depends on the user and you don't know this P. And this is something that you want to infer, which might be very, very hard, but still you can assume that uh, this P is coming from a certain global distribution, which in this case is a better distribution with parameters A, B. So globally speaking, so to say, you mainly care about alpha R for the transaction and for A, B for the probability. And one little technical assumption is that these kind of quantities are independent on each other. So whatever you can draw from this model are based on this assumption and there are ways of making this assumption stronger or weaker. But the, the, the nice thing about it is that you can explicitly write your likelihood, likelihood function uh, and, and optimize to get the parameters uh, alpha, r, a, and b for an average user. And you could even actually estimate this for, for individual users, let's say the lambdas and the p's, but this is a much more complex model. So uh, we have done some work in that regard and we have proven actually that, let's say the frequentist uh, way of doing this in Python with the famous lifetime package, it, it fits uh, what you would expect from the, from the Bayesian approach. So let's say we haven't gotten that much yet so here you see the distribution of the learning parameters from a specific example, and the vertical gray lines show the mean and the quantiles of what you would expect from the frequentist approach. So at least it's consistent, but we haven't gotten anything exciting yet. Uh, but for decision making, especially thinking about the churn prevention problem, having kind of an uncertainty band on the probability of being active at user level is actually quite helpful because it's, it becomes now Let's say we know that certain users might have, have a high chance of, of being inactive. What are we going to do about that? Uh, we could send a discount, we could send an email. And now we enter this world of cultural influence where we actually want to see uh, whether the treatments that we do to prevent these users to train are effective or not. Uh, but of course, sending discounts can be a very sensitive decision. So. Uh, the, the uncertainty, or let's say the certainty we have about the, the estimations uh, comes also uh, as an important part of the decision-making process. Uh, for the gamma-gamma model, you have certain type of, let's say, assumptions, which uh, you can check out in the references, but it, they're very kind of similar in spirit. And then for each user, you can ex uh, get the expected mean. And moreover, once you learn this, a hyperparameters from this global distribution, you can actually draw conclusions about an unseen user, uh, which uh, also comes uh, very handy for, for modeling purposes. So uh, an experiment that I did, uh, which shows actually the power of the Bayesian approach is when you take this framework and build a hierarchy about it. So this is where uh, Bayesian models come uh, with a full power. So uh, in this plot, which might look a little bit complex, I'm gonna just summarize the results. What I did was to take four cohorts of users uh, and train this model for all of them independently. Uh, but one of the cohorts actually is very small and we don't have a lot of data. 
uh, and the estimates of AB and era alpha actually differ quite a lot, but they they were actually gotten from a, a very similar distribution. So we actually expect this actually to be a little bit similar to the other cohort. So essentially we're feeding noise, a, a lot of noise with these very small cohorts. So what, it, what we can do or what I did is to build a hierarchical model a, on top of this BG and BD. And what we actually get is much more reasonable a, results. So kind of, this plus show the, the, the protection of the lifetime package or the frequencies approach in the X axis and the Y axis is the estimation of the hierarchical model. And what we see is that overall the hierarchical model brings values which are more closer to the global mean. And this is what is called a shrinkage phenomena. And let's say thinking about the business, uh, this is allowing us to, in some extent, solve the cold start problem for new cohorts. Uh, and this is something that you would expect from the intuition, because if a user joined in May, uh, they shouldn't be that different from the users that, uh, that join in, in June. So this type of uh, information transfer through hierarchical models is actually pretty useful. And this is an idea that has a, a very, very uh, important implications for production life systems. So when you think about a customer lifetime value and probability of being uh, active and you start thinking about incentives and, and how to measure these treatment effects, uh, you naturally come into the world of cultural influence, which is a big world, which I'm trying to discover by myself. And the more I read about it, the more, let's say, the, the bigger I, I see this huge world is, but nevertheless, it's very, very interesting. And it's a field on which based on methods actually have a huge potential. So cultural pie is yet another product that uh, the folks from PyMC Labs have been developed where they provide a very nice API and framework to estimate different type of um, average treatment effect with different methods depending on, on the problem at hand. So one of them is synthetic control, which could fit very well with the geo-experimentation problem I showed at the very beginning, but there are other methods which uh, different in difference or regression discontinuity and they have a really nice api the plots and the visualization is really great so if you haven't checked that out please do i think uh, this is not i don't have enough time to talk about this uh, probably ben from the pymc labs team it's a uh, it's a better person to, to talk about it but nevertheless i want to mention uh, as, as a very important application in marketing and, and applications as a side note, I don't, I'm not going to talk a lot about in details, but let's say what's the gain of, of uh, Bayesian methods uh, in this story of cultural influence if I already can get those estimations from the frequentist approach? And I think that's a quite a reasonable question. I did an experiment with a kind of like the PIMC implementation of an idea of, of, of another person, which I'll add to the reference, where uh, they have this non-complying effect. So let us assume we have a, a user that you know that's gonna turn and you want to send an incentive and maybe you send a push notification. Uh, but maybe, uh, and, and let us assume that these notifications for whatever reason, they don't work well in all phones. So they don't reach all of the users. Uh, if you kind of analyze this experiment, if you do an A-B test, then this is going to be biased because maybe users which all phones uh, do not have a lot of money and don't spend a lot as compared to the ones that have the new iPhone. So in order to control for that, uh, you can use instrumental variables to get a kind of a better estimation accounting also for this non-compliant effect. Uh, and the plot uh, on the top shows the kind of uh, uh, estimation of the of the average treatment effect and the, the one below is uh, the same estimation but actually passing uh, information of previous experiments through the priors and what you gain is effectively to reduce the variance and be much more certain uh, about your current experiment based on what you learned from the past and in in business kind of context the experience from previous experiments uh, it's it's really useful. Let's say you want to pass it experience and you don't want the model to start from scratch every time. So this is a very interesting problem. And this is yet another example where the patient methods come as the key component to have better estimations on, for example, uh, incentives uh, effect on users. 
Uh, and the last application that I want to talk about is one that I've been working quite recently. And it's, it's a little bit a non-standard one, uh, which is a retention modeling. So if you think about retention or customer lifetime value, these are, these are things that you care a lot. Uh, and to be completely honest, kind of cracking the customer lifetime value problem at user level is very tricky. Uh, the BGNBD model, what I show you, it's, it's a good baseline, but uh, the comp the, the, let's say the assumption might be a little bit too simple to, to model all the distribution of users that you have. And there are other type of models which actually have more parameters are more flexible, but that comes with a cost of, of complexity. And uh, in certain business applications, you maybe don't care much about the specific retention, but also you want to see your customer base uh, let's say in particular the cohorts, meaning when they the month defined by the month where they join, and see how this develops over time to 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 essentially assess whether your 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 customers are being sticky enough uh, with uh, with your product. And one way of kind of looking into this type of metrics is to uh, look into what is called a retention metrics. So on the y-axis you have the cohort. So when the users came, so to say, and on the y-axis is the period, let's say the observation period. So let's say this 17% here on the top left, uh, I'm removing the diagonal, of course, because uh, this, the retention is always one, says that uh, the users that join uh, on uh, the 1st of January 2020, 17% came the, day, the, the month after. And then, uh, out of this initial cohorts, then for the next month, 9% and then 4%. And this you can also do for, for all cohorts. And just by the color coding, this is a simulation that I run, you see that the retention increases in winter. Let's say that you have a product which is very suited for people when they're at home and where when summer comes, people don't use it that much. So this is some, like you see a cyclic pattern, but you also want to see whether there's a global trend. Uh, so we can just tell these numbers and try to to see how can you get uh, what you can get out of them. But what I try to do is to try to build certain type of model to kind of extract the, the, the most important information uh, outside of it. So again, it's always very important to think about features because at the very end, uh, kind of the features I was going to give you is, is the way to get from the data to, to the information that is valuable for you. So for these retention metrics, I care about the age, which is effectively, let's say, how long since they join as compared to the observation time. The cohort, uh, uh, the cohort age, uh, sorry, the, the age is the, the age of the period with respect to the, the initial date. So for example, for the 17%, this uh, has uh, age of one. For 9%, this is has age of two and so on and so forth. This is kind of the relative. You can also have the absolute total age. Uh, and we see some seasonal patterns here. So you can also consider all the type of features. So this is kind of the, 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 the main feature which kind of model or like serve to describe these metrics, but then you can build on top of that many other, other uh, features. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details, but what you can do is uh, model the retention kind of explicitly through kind of linear combination of the age, cohort age, and the month. And in certain simulations, it works pretty well. But at some point, kind of the it maybe does not fit all the time, and the relationship is a little bit complex. So maybe you can start adding quadratic trends or maybe splines. Uh, but I actually discovered through looking to this problem about Bayesian additive regression trees, which should resemble a lot to tree-based methods in classical machine learning, although they're not exactly the same. And what I did is to write the, the retention component uh, as a model with, uh, with BART, with one of these trees. So, which is non-parametric, and I'm telling the model, hell, I don't want to do the feature engineering. You can do this for me. Uh, and I add the seasonality there because let's say for, for many applications, the seasonality is essentially encoding in the retention. And I can also have a, a similar matrix, which uh, encodes the revenue. 
which of course is going to depend on the number of active users. So to be a little bit more precise, the retention I modeled uh, with a yeah, link function through a patient additive regression tree. And now I can use a binomial likelihood to take the no total number of users per cohort uh, and, and just model that through the retention to get the number of active users that I see. And kind of, I expect that the, the revenue to be proportional to the number of active users. Uh, and I expect this to be, let's say I can use a linear model now to, to, to model the, the revenue part, which since I know it's a positive quantity, I could use, for example, like gamma likelihood and the parameter of, of this gamma likelihood, which is in some sense the average revenue per user, I can use a linear model. Uh, but this is not kind of the unique way of doing this. Then you can, for example, use yet another BART model for the revenue. I, I, I feel like most of the nonlinearity often comes in the retention, but you can also do that uh, or even go in the direction of Gaussian process and so on. What I wanted to show with this slide is that you can couple problems and have two outcomes within the same Bayesian model, which is uh, the retention and, and, and the revenue. So I guess, um, you can always look into the into the code, which resembles quite a lot uh, the math and, and the equations. Uh, I don't want to go into detail because of the sake of time. What I want to point out is that this type of model shows how to convert a matrix into kind of model into a Bayesian model where you have two outputs. We have the retention and the revenue, and you can couple them together and learn the parameters uh, in, in the models uh, together. So one thing that I've also been doing is to kind of stratify this per acquisition channel. So what if, uh, let's say, challenge the idea that certain channels can have better or worse retention by, when controlling by seasonality than others. And this is a kind of very important thinking about the, the overall kind of optimization part because maybe the media mix model is telling me to invest in certain channel but it's also important to look into the retention per channel to see if actually uh, customers from a very efficient channel are actually not worth uh, gathering just because the retention is too low. So again, it's not about the model, it's about the tools and the information that they can provide to you to solve very specific uh, problems. In this case, for example, the marketing acquisition uh, problem so that it actually, it's, uh, it's effectively positive for your revenue. Uh, and I use this in practice to get out of sample predictions. So this is part of a, of a simulation. And I've seen in practice this BART model couple with the revenue model, with the linear revenue model to work surprisingly well. It's a very solid baseline. And then from this baseline, you can start adding features uh, to, to make your model more complex and just try to extract different type of information, but a relatively simple model, but which has been working quite good in, in practice. All right, I think this is what I wanted to talk to you about. I know it was a little bit fast, but this was the intention so that you get excited and and and, and curious about what you can do with patient models. So in, in, in marketing, and again, this is just my experience and which is by no means exhaustive, there are probably people and, and experts which can have a broader view on, on, on different types of applications. For example, something that I didn't talk about that much is A-B testing. I briefly talked that through the instrumental variable example, but hopefully you can go into these references, which are the main ones for this talk and, and get excited uh, and, and explore this. Uh, in particular, uh, packages like PyMC Marketing, Carshall Pi, which is something that we are trying to develop uh, in conjunction with the PyMC Lab folks so that we can make all of these techniques uh, more accessible to a broader audience. Uh, thank you. You can always find uh, me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter-ish, uh, but also my, my website. So you can take this, scan this, it's when it reduced.github.io. Uh, and lastly, I'm gonna finalize and share it uh, now, or like leave this space for, for Thomas to talk about, about how PyMC Labs uh, can help you get started with this, or actually even uh, 
help you go uh, the, the next step in your Bayesian modeling uh, applications and work. All right. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, Juan, that was really amazing uh, tour de force of um, many things you, you can do. And it's fun to see um, yeah, the, the whole overview of, of things. Usually in my talks, I just dive into a single one. And of course, you sort of miss, miss the breadth of all the different things you can do and how they connect to each other. Um, so there are many questions which we'll get to. I just wanted to announce one cool thing um, that, that we're trying out. So I'm aware that this uh, the, the possibilities seem endless. And um, hopefully, we were successful in getting you excited about these tools. But if you saw this and you're like, well, this seems like it could be really useful to me, but I'm not quite sure how it really applies to me, right? Like these tools you can use to build your own, say, in house marketing analytics pipeline. Uh, but one thing we found is that the way that you want to combine them is you really unique for everyone. So there's no one size fits all solution. And that is why we're also like building various tools that then can interact with each other. So this is something new that we're trying to help you with that. If if that is the your situation, we at Pants Labs have a lot of experience with that. Um, and we help companies like HelloFresh, for example, really bring their marketing analytics pipeline to the next level and uh, develop for them a media mix model. There's quite a few blog posts on this on our blog. Uh, and, and they're using that very successfully now to make marketing budget allocations across most of their international markets. So, and HelloFresh is a food delivery company. Uh, we haven't heard about them. So uh, for those who are here, I'd uh, like to make a very special offer. Um, something that we're trying to help you with this is, uh, and my team is happy to jump on a free 30-minute uh, strategy consultation call where we do a deep dive into what your pipeline currently looks like and maybe where there's room for improvement and how those tools can be most beneficial to you and how to sort of incorporate them to bring your analytics to the next level. So here is the link to uh, my Calendly um, to wiki base. I'm going to post this in chat as well. So uh, yeah, if you go there, then um, you'll just pick a time that works best for you. And then I'm going to be super excited to uh, to meet and chat um, and really trying to make these tools more accessible. Um, then also, uh, we run corporate workshops. So if you want to upskill your data science team, then this might be an option for you. It's uh, it's very applied, very hands-on. It just teaches PIMC, how rocket the modeling, linear modeling, uh, time series, all kinds of things through applied remotely taught sessions. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, um, just send me an email um, and I can tell you more info about them. If you go to our website, there's also um, a section on that that you can uh, find. So um, that was that now there's a lot of questions um hopefully we can get through a good chunk of them so maybe what i'll do is i'll just read them to you juan and then um you can um you can give an answer i'm just going to pick semi-randomly from these um so Tom, rodica asks, uh, yeah you want to um, sort by most upvotes in case at the top oh yeah sure um so, um, yeah, so there are so many parameters in the MMM, some of which are not identifiable. Uh, for example, shape parameters and the situation functions. I'm wondering, one, which are the important parameters we better have good information priors to? Uh, we better have good informative priors to obtain reliable results, is the first question. Second question is, when model um, may goes down to two to 3%, um, any concerns of overfitting? And three, how to calibrate the MMM with experimental findings? Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the question. I would, I've also read through all of the rest of the questions and 
the short answer for all of them, it, it always depends on the data. So unfortunately, I cannot give you a silver bullet way of, of assessing this. So in the case of media mix model, at least my experience is that before doing any type of modeling, just literally stare at the data and see, let's say, to try to explain kind of peaks and patterns from domain knowledge. So, because it could be that maybe your brand is already, let's say, quite established and you expect maybe higher saturation because you all you have a lot of uh, presence in the internet. Uh, maybe the markets on where you have have a very high internet penetration, so you don't think saturation it's an important part of the model. Uh, so this is the type of thing that you need to look into before jumping into the modeling. Uh, I would also advise to start with simple models so that you just add kind of even start with the linear regression and let's say look into the data and see where did you let's say where the, the variance is not entirely captured and still being the, on top of that so that you don't put everything in into the mix. And of course, one of the problem is overfitting, but within this Bayesian framework, there are various ways of, of handling this. And a, a, a nice package to, to look into is Arvis, uh, where they have very yeah, kind of diagnostic, but you can get a kind of a measure of a out of sample or like hold out sample, uh, Kind of prediction accuracy without having to 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 train a model. So there's a solid statistical theory behind that. So there are ways of accounting for that, but I think the short answer is it really depends on the data. It starts simple, and and kind of the domain knowledge should drive the model building. What we've done with PyMC marketing, it's it's a very solid baseline. So it's much better than a linear regression because you have all of these parameters. And actually, very recently, I pushed a, a change in the, in, the, in the master branch where you can actually constrain uh, the priors uh, depending on certain type of information. So uh, please go and check the MMM example notebook in the master branch because we have discussions about how to do some uh, prior kind of uh, selection if you don't have a lot of information. And regarding experimentation, this is a tricky one. Unfortunately, I don't have a complete answer. It depends on the type of experiments that you run uh, and it depends on the type of uh, target metric that you want. So in, in, in the, for example, in the uh, case of custom acquisition where you want, you have an estimation on the CAC, for example, the PyMC Labs folks also have a nice blog post about how they can parameterize the saturation function in terms of this variable so that you have a better parameterization to, in, to input those uplift tests. Uh, but it's not trivial in my opinion, um, but hopefully with, with some study experience and thought with the PMC labs, we can, we can push this to, to PMC marketing. Let's see. Thanks, yeah. So Mark asks, uh, in the MMM, I wonder how do you encode categorical control variables? Uh, so if you think about the kind of non-time varying coefficient case where you just have the, maybe you want to control for holidays like Christmas or Black Friday, you can add a, a simple dummy variable like that. This might work. Another thing that could uh, be helpful is the use of bump functions. So if you think about Christmas, for example, if you, for whatever reason, want to control, let's say extract the effect of media for, for Christmas, what you can do is actually, because Christmas is all the season, so it's not just on the on the 25th of December. So something that I've used in the past is actually go to Google Trends and type for Christmas for a specific market. And then you could have a nice proxy of the, of the season, and then you just take one of these and, and model this, this bump function. So you can either use dummies or this type of feature engineering tricks. Next question from Vaclav. First, uh, how to deal with latent variables? Mm, I mean, for example, in, in the BART model, uh, the retention itself, it, it, it's a it's a latent variable. So in the model itself, I'm not mute, I'm not putting the retention as the outcome. I'm putting the number of active users. So 
that depends on the parameterization, but you can learn that through MCMC. So the, the tricky part is how do you learn the model structure? I think this should come from experience and domain knowledge. And I think, yeah, I guess what most people do is start very simple and start looking into kind of the Bayesian workflow. Let's say, look into the errors where the variance is not explained, how the out of, let's say, the predictions look. And, and and really think about the data generation process. There's no brute force approach, but really think about the data generation process. So I really talked about the I talked about the BGNBD model because I guess it would have been very difficult for for someone just to get the likelihood uh, directly. But it was better to say, okay, let us assume that this decaying function because people might eventually just leave, and uh, every user has a coin. And, and that that's gonna determine whether they leave or not. Of course, this is just a proxy of, okay, there's some decision that we don't understand, but we can model through this fictitious coin uh, and you write the likelihood. So the core component to get all these latent variables and, and the model structure is really to think about the data generation process. And how to generally decide about the distributions. I guess there are certain type of Maybe obvious, for example, if you want to constrain a, a parameter to be positive, you can have a half normal or half t student, depending on the properties. Uh, I think it comes with experience, but also there's a strong literature about it. So, for example, the STAN documentation also has very nice uh, guidelines of how to effectively select and parameterize certain type of models because. Uh, let's say one side of the of, of the story is the model parameterization, but if you want to run MCMC, you actually kind of care about the parameterization because it could be that the parameterization is not optimal for the sampler itself. So these things get a little bit tricky, but there are nice guys guidelines that you can find and I probably can add to the slide where where you can have certain type of defaults or practices to to look into that. Right. Yeah, and I would also add prior predictive checks yeah yeah That'd absolutely be helpful um so well uh, we're definitely not going to get through all of them one uh we'll try and do a couple of more but anything um that we don't answer we encourage you to add that question to the youtube video when we post it and then we'll answer it there in text uh, so apologies if we don't get to yours and also um i see that actually a lot of people are signing up for the um, uh, for the strategy consultation, which is great. Um, if you don't find a slot, just uh, you can also email me, and then I'll, I'll try to find something which slots are booked out. So um, yeah, if you observe a baseline uplift after a campaign, how do you measure it in a media mix model? Are you in cumulative spend as a channel variable? I think this is where this slide where you have attributes and experimentation and media mix come into, into the game. I, I haven't seen, maybe um, I, I, I don't know it yet, but like a global model which captures all of this. So you start maybe with the attribution uh, as, a, as a way of, of getting the input data from the media mix model in some extent. And then you can, what people do is to calibrate uh, the priors or, or the, the MMM through this experiment. So you do this implicitly. Let's say the media mix model is to have more holistic view of, of the marketing kind of development because it's trying to look for a regression type of approach. And the experiments give you in some in some way a certain touch to reality of the model. But experiments can are also not not feasible in marketing every time because they are costly. And, and you cannot just run experiments every time. It, it gets a little bit tricky or need to optimize for that. And an experiment can also be biased. So I guess what you usually need to do is somehow blend the MMM and the attribution results and use the experiments as kind of a, like a fixing a reality a kind of component into the MMM. And again, there's no silver bullet. We're going to try to make it more accessible. In practice, this depends a lot on the data and the type of experiments that you have. Yeah. Um, so then one last question um, that is dear to my heart. So I'm going to uh, feel that one. Han Yuan asks, how do you exp uh, could you explain how your hierarchical model solves the cold start problem again? So for me, hierarchical models is like the superpower of Bayesian modeling. and 
the way you can think about this is say you have 10 marketing channels, right? And one of them you just turned on, right? So if you haven't seen any data on that, um, probably you would assume that it's going to be similar to the other ones that you have seen, right? And a hierarchical model allows you to model this structure that you think that in the absence of data is probably going to be similar to the, to the average channel, essentially. So you have a global average that you're modeling, which is the top of the hierarchy, and then you have individual channels, uh, ROS, for example, uh, that you model. And as you get more data, then you can sort of learn more and that can deviate from the mean. But in the absence of data, you just kind of predict it's going to be the average, essentially. So that's the logic behind it. Uh, there's a lot more to be said and definitely something that's very worthwhile to check out uh, how Rocket Lamont's are awesome. And for me, is the, uh, when I got introduced to Bayesian modeling uh, over a decade ago, uh, the moment where it clicked, where I was like, okay, well, this is really cool. So uh, yeah, with that, I think we're at time. Again, we're going to post this online. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions. There were um, a whole lot of them and we uh, and really great ones. We really appreciate everyone coming out and asking questions and being engaged in, in the open source and, and the community in general. Uh, a lot of people joined the Discord, which is very exciting. I look forward to speaking to some of you um, one on one. And uh, yeah, so with that, uh, thanks for coming and thanks, Juan, for uh, an amazing presentation. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah, it was really great uh, to to have the opportunity to talk about this project and yeah, keep keep up the good work with the PyMC Lab tools. Thanks so much. See you, everybody. Bye.